Well, imagine with me, if you would, for a minute, a basketball team. Okay, how many players are on a court at a time for one basketball team? Five, right? Yeah, five. So imagine a team of five, right, where four of those five have no idea what the point of the game is. That they have no idea that the point of the game is to score more points than the other team, right? They have no idea exactly what they're supposed to be doing. How effective do you think that team is going to be? Not very effective at all, right? They might end up doing lots of things. They might run all over the court and be really busy and, and, and doing lots of activities. But if they don't understand the main point of what they're supposed to be out there doing, it's not going to lead them anywhere. It's not going to help them accomplish their, their mission as a team, right? To score more points and win the game. Well, in many ways, that's unfortunately kind of a sad picture of the state of the church today when it comes to understanding our mission. <clears throat> many Christians in many churches have forgotten, they've neglected, they've kind of drifted away from the mission that Jesus has given us as his church. A Barna survey a few years back found that four out of five Christians surveyed didn't even know what the Great Commission was. They had, or they had heard that phrase before, but they weren't sure what it meant. The Great Commission is what we're going to talk about today. The Great Commission is the mission that Jesus has given to His church. And so now if you're here today and, and you're one of those four that like, well, I don't really know what the Great Commission is. That's fine. That's fine. My point here isn't to shame anybody. Uh, I don't want to assume that everyone here knows or has heard of the Great Commission. In fact, I'm going to assume the opposite. I'm going to assume none of us know what the Great Commission is, and we're going to kind of boil this down to a basic level and help us understand, well, what is the mission of the church? And so we're going to spend some time today talking about the Great Commission. So we can remind each other, we can remind our hearts, remind our minds what we're supposed to be focused on as a church. And that focus is supposed to be on making disciples of Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're going to focus today. Uh, what exactly our mission is, how we go about doing it, those are going to be some of the core questions we, we jump in today as we look at the Great Commission. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, we're going to look at verses 16 through 20. If you're using one of our blue Bibles, it's on page 9. 93. So Matthew 28, the last passage of the book of Matthew, starting in verse 16. The Word of God says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the Word of God. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we reflect on this command, this commission that you left with your disciples and that you've left with your church to make disciples of all nations. Would you help us today as we focus our hearts and focus our minds here? Would you open our eyes to see wondrous things out of your word this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, since last September, uh, we've been going through a sermon series called Knowing Our King. Right? We've been walking through the Gospel of Matthew, and my hope, my prayer through this series has just been simply that we just get to know Jesus more. Right? We get to know who He is, get to know why He came into the world, and what difference He wants to make in us and through us in this world. And I've wanted to help us understand that we have a King. We have a Sovereign over us in Jesus, whose life so resonated 2,000 years ago that it's still resonating even today among men and women all over the world. And it will continue to resonate for all of eternity. But as we come to the end of Matthew this morning, I want us to see that all of this knowing Jesus, right? Not only knowing about Him, not just knowing facts about Him, but truly knowing Him, 
in a personal, transforming way, all of that knowing leads us to something. Okay? It leads us somewhere. Just like the men and, and the disciples we talked about last Sunday with the resurrection of Jesus, how they seen the risen Jesus had changed them, we too can encounter the risen Jesus and not be changed. We can't know Jesus and not be changed by Jesus. Okay, so to be a Christian is to be continually changed for the rest of our lives, increasingly into the image of Jesus. And then to help others in that process as well. And so if we find ourselves unwilling to change, we have to ask ourselves, what's, what's wrong in my heart? Because being a Christian is a lifelong process of change, of being transformed into the image of Jesus. And so knowing our King, knowing our King Jesus, should always lead us to making Him known. Okay, to wanting to see Him known in this world. And again, I'm not talking about knowing everything. It's not like we have to have complete knowledge about Jesus before we can go and start sharing Jesus. It's just knowing Him in a personal way way as our Lord and Savior. And then as we learn, we just share what we learn with others to help them grow as well. And so my main point this morning is because we know our King, because we know King Jesus, we must now obediently seek to make disciples of Jesus of all nations. Okay, that's the Great Commission. That's our mission as Christ's church. And so we're going to ask a few questions to help us learn and hopefully to, that the Spirit will use the transform us as we talk about our mission. And so we're going to dig into what is our mission, right? Just understanding basically what is the mission Jesus left for his church. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how do we do this? How do we do it? And then we're going to look at how can we do this? It seems like such a daunting task, making disciples of all nations. How can we possibly do this? Okay, so let's walk through these. Well, first, what is our mission? What is the mission? Remember the context here first. Remember what had just happened prior to this. Jesus was crucified, right, on the cross, taken down, dead, placed in the tomb, and then three days later rose again to new new life. He came back to life. He rose again. And then he appears to many eyewitnesses. Okay, and so our passage here is Jesus, the risen Jesus, speaking to his disciples, okay, after he had risen, but before he ascends to heaven, before he ascends to sit at the right hand of the Father. And so before we dig into the, what the mission is, I want to make just a quick note about verse 17. Because you read that and it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Okay, that some doubted. So it seems like something we shouldn't just brush past, right? What is, what, what's happening here? Well, Now, Matthew's account of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, we have to remember that this is much more of just a summary of those appearances compared to like Luke and John's Gospels. Okay, Matthew here isn't giving us all the details about who doubted or why they doubted and all those kind of things. It's just an acknowledgement that some of the disciples doubted when they heard the news that Jesus had risen. Okay, which if you think about it, that's a pretty understandable thing considering what we're talking about, right? We're talking about them getting news that someone they saw crucified, dead in a tomb, was now alive. Okay, I think doubt is probably a reasonable first response to that, right? And so, I mean, we see in Luke 24 and John 20, both mention the disciples not believing the news that Jesus was risen at first, Probably most well-known is the account of Thomas, right? Doubting Thomas. How he told the other disciples, I'm not going to believe unless I see the scars in Jesus' hands and see the scar in his side from where he was pierced with a spear. Right? I'm not going to believe unless I see those scars. And then Jesus appears, shows himself to Thomas, and then he believes. But what we can see is whatever doubt did exist at first, We know that it disappeared because of how the disciples responded to Jesus' commands, both here and later after the arrival of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the book of Acts. Right? They all went out from here willingly facing persecution, willingly facing death to proclaim this news that Jesus was alive. 
okay, that he was risen. So they gave their lives to this truth. And so if the apostles went out from here in pursuit of this mission that Jesus had given them, we should ask then what exactly was their mission? And then by extension, what exactly is our mission today? We call this mission, what Jesus tells us, what he commands us here, the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Jesus commissioning us to go and do this. By his authority, commissioning us, bringing us in and sending us out to do this. Okay, so but what exactly is that mission? Look at verse 19. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Okay, so from that verse, what is the core of our mission? Is it the going? Is it the baptizing? Is it the teaching? What's the core of our mission? What specifically is our mission here? Well, in this verse, there's actually only one imperative verb. Okay, an imperative verb is, is, is a word we use that gives a command. Okay, it's like, you know, bring me a cup of coffee, right? Take out the, the trash. Clean your room. Those are commands, right? Well, in this verse, there's one command. There's one imperative. The imperative here in verse 19 is make disciples. Make disciples. That's the core of the Great Commission. The core of Jesus' command to his followers is to go and make disciples. Okay, that's the mission that Jesus left his disciples, and that's the mission still for us today as the church. Make disciples. And so we should ask then, well, what exactly is a disciple? Right? That's kind of a fundamental question. If we're supposed to go and make disciples, what's a disciple? If I was, if I was to tell all of you to go out and make widgets, right? Your first question back to me should be, well, what's a widget? Right? So I know what we're supposed to go make. And so we should understand, well, what is a disciple? How do we know if we're making disciples? Well, basic definition of a disciple is someone who is a learner. Someone who's a learner. Someone who's a, a follower. Okay? Someone, a disciple is someone who learns and applies the teachings of someone else and applies it to their own life. They infuse the teachings of someone else into their own life and make them their own. Okay, as, as Christians, that's what we do with Jesus. We take his teachings, his ways, his motivations, his methods, and we make them our own. We apply them to our lives. And so we increasingly let go of our own ways, doing things how we see best or how the world tells us to do things. And we increasingly take hold of how Jesus does things, how he calls and how he teaches us to do things. Okay. So if you are a Christian, if your faith is in Jesus, then you are a disciple. Okay, there's no category in the Bible for Christians who are not disciples. Okay, so disciples, sometimes we hear that and we think, well, that's like a category of like super Christians or something. It's like, no, all Christians are disciples in the sense that we all need to be learning and following and becoming more like Jesus. And so we're all being discipled towards something. Okay, we're either being discipled to become increasingly like Jesus and follow him, or we're being discipled by the world to increasingly not be like Jesus. Okay, we're being discipled away from Jesus. And so as a, the church, our mission is to make disciples, to help people know and follow Jesus. And so to make disciples then is to help others learn and live out the ways of Jesus in their lives. It's to replicate the life of Jesus in their life. And to do this continually toward ever-increasing maturity, ever-increasing growth in Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Colossians 1 that we proclaim and we teach so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And so whatever point someone is at in their faith, whatever point, we want to be continually guiding them that next step deeper into maturity and following Jesus, wherever they're at. So if they're not yet a believer, maybe you don't yet have faith in Jesus, we want to come alongside people. We want to pray for them to know Jesus. We want to help them wrestle through that and any questions they might have, share the truth of Jesus with them so they can decide that and wrestle with that 
in their lives. If they're a, a new Christian, we want to come alongside them and help them understand, okay, what is the next step I need to take in my faith? How do I continue to grow in my faith? Or if you've been a Christian for decades, we want to help you understand what is the next step for you in your faith. And I can, ten, can tell you, part of that being a disciple is making disciples. Our growth comes to the fore. It, it just explodes when we begin helping others learn and grow. Okay. So we should always be asking, what are you teaching me, God? Right? What are you teaching me through these circumstances, through where I'm at in life, through what I'm reading, what I'm learning? What are you trying to teach me here so I can become more like Jesus? And so at its core, that's what our mission is. It's to make disciples of Jesus. However we might word or phrase it as the church, that's the core of our mission. But what about all these other phrases that here in verses 19 and 20? Like go, like all nations, you know, baptizing, teaching. What about all those phrases? Right? Because all of those phrases are part of the Great Commission too. And so how do these things all fit together with making disciples? Because they do fit together. They all fit together with our core mission of making disciples. Well, these phrases, these other phrases actually help us understand how we should go about making disciples, how we make disciples. Okay, they help us understand the how of our mission. And so let's briefly walk through these uh, four other phrases. First, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Okay, this simple word right here should just flood our lives with intentionality. It should just flood us with intentionality. This should drive each of us to ask, how do we do this? How can we go do this? How can we be part of God's mission for us in making disciples? What, what needs to change or happen in my life so I can be intentionally engaged in making disciples? Whether that's with my family, whether that's friends, whether that's coworkers, whether that's neighbors, whether that's strangers I haven't met yet, how can I orient my life to be a part of this mission that Jesus has called me to? A lot of pastors will talk about how the days of just expecting people to just walk into the church. Okay, like we could just sit in our, in our pews and we could just have people just come to the church and then we will meet with them, we'll connect with them there, and then we'll start discipling them. A lot of pastors will talk about how those days are gone. Right? Like those, those days of just allowing people to, to, waiting for them to come to us, those days with the change in our culture, those days are gone. I would argue, based on this verse, that those days never existed. Those days never existed. Never was there a time where the church should just sit back and wait for people to come to us. With this command, go, go, therefore, go make disciples, there's never been a point in the church's history where it was okay for us to just sit back and wait for people to come to us, to share who Jesus is. We need to go and engage the world around us. It's not for us to just sit in, in church pews on Sunday mornings, although that's an incredibly critical part of being the church, is gathering and worshiping together. But that doesn't replace being engaged in the mission the rest of the week. Okay? I believe because many churches, many Christians, many people have done that, I think it's caused harm to our mission as the church. Because at some point things shifted and it became more about a, you know, creating the church as a country club where we come and we cater to people's needs versus engaging them and equipping them and sending them out to make Jesus known. Okay? So he calls, us, calls for us to intentionally look for ways to help others know and follow him. The next phrase then is, of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. And so this explains our where, our who we should go pursue making disciples. Of all nations, all people groups. We don't, it's not just you know, the, the nations that we see on a map today around the world. It's not just those political boundaries that we know of as nations today. This is all language groups, all people groups. So you could have multiple, many people groups inside one nation. Okay, so this is of all language groups, all people groups, all around the world. And this is the very end that God has sovereignly ordained will happen. This is what he said he will do in the world. 
He said he will build his church, and this is the result. All people from all nations worship him. All people from all nations worship him. Re- Revelation 7 tells us this, verses 9 and 10. This gives us a picture of what God is working towards in the world. It says this, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Okay, God will see that that is accomplished through us, through His church. This is a promise that He's going to do this through His church. And so this shows us then what we should be working toward as a church. We should be working in the same direction, working with the same flow that God is moving, making disciples of all nations. And so we do that here locally, making disciples of our local community, but we do it also in cooperation and alongside the global church, right? Supporting and sending missionaries to all people groups to help them know and follow Jesus. This is why we need to be a church who encourages and, and, and plants churches, right? So we can be engaged in this great commission of making disciples. And then third, Jesus uh, uses this phrase, baptizing. Baptizing. Verse 19, of back in Matthew 28, that we make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so, here in this passage, and then also through his example, we remember when Jesus was baptized back in Matthew 4. And then elsewhere also, Jesus is instructing us both to be baptized as his disciples and also to go about baptizing others as the church. We go about making disciples by baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so baptizing them in that name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit means the life of the one being baptized has been joined together in this vital relationship with God. So we give our lives over to God, and baptism becomes a recognition of that. And so we believe as a church that the biblical pattern of baptism that we see in Scripture, as we look and as we study Scripture, is that someone first believes, right? They repent of their sin. They place their faith in the saving work of of Jesus for them. And then they recognize that. They acknowledge that by being baptized. And so baptism is an outward reflection of an inner work that God has already done in our hearts. That means baptism in and of itself is not the means for people to to be saved. It doesn't provide salvation. It's an outward proclamation of a heart that's already been saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And that's why we practice at Rock Haven what we call believer's baptism. And so if you believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again for your sins to be forgiven, and you repent of your sin and place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us you will be saved. And then Jesus calls us to next to be baptized. Take that step of being baptized in obedience to Jesus because he calls us to do it, to proclaim his work in our hearts and lives to the world as we believe in him. And so if there's anyone here who's been wrestling with that or thinking about that or uh, considering that, uh, that step of obedience and being baptized yourself, like I shared earlier, we're going to have that opportunity coming up here in a few weeks. And so if you have questions, I invite you to come join us next Sunday right after the service as we talk about baptism, have a brief baptism Uh, class to teach more about going a little bit more depth than we can right here about baptism and what we believe uh, it truly is. Because for many of us, we probably grew up in different traditions than what we practice here, just like me. I grew up in a different tradition where we view baptism differently. Okay, and so we just want to have a time of be able to talk about that and answer any questions. Uh, And if you are considering baptism, let me know. I'd love to talk uh, through that with you as we consider it together. And then the fourth phrase that we see here that I want to touch on is teaching. Verse 20. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. 
An essential part of our commission to make disciples involves making Jesus known. We teach and we communicate about the life, the work, and the commands of Jesus. We need to know who He is and what He's done for us and what difference He wants to make in us and through us before we can share that with the world, right? That's exactly why we wanted to do this sermon series. So we could get to know Jesus, so we could teach, so we could share Jesus with others. This isn't just teaching to just transfer information. This isn't just about information transfer. This is about teaching for transformation. Okay, the purpose of making disciples is to see lives transformed by the power of the gospel, changed by the good news about the saving work of Jesus. We don't just call people to head knowledge. We guide them both to head and heart knowledge that leads to obedience, that leads to transformation, that leads to change in people's lives. And so we as believers need to be able to communicate the truth of the gospel in ways that resonate in the hearts and minds of those we're trying to reach. To be able to do that, we need to know what the gospel actually is. When we say we're going to share the gospel, we're going to teach the gospel, well, what is the gospel? And so that's why starting next Sunday, we're going to transition into a short sermon series and spend three weeks talking about that idea, well, what is the gospel? What truly is it? When we use that word, what do we mean by that? And so we're going to start that next next Sunday and spend a few weeks teaching on that. Because all of this is part of our vision. We have a vision here at Rock Haven of making disciples of Jesus Christ by becoming what we call a gospel wellspring. Okay, being a continual supply of the gospel into all situations of life that God places us in. Being a continual supply of the hope and the truth of the gospel into wherever God plants us, wherever God places us. And so finally, as we think about this mission of making disciples, how can we even do this? Right? This seems like such a daunting mission. Making disciples of all nations? Really? That that's, seems like such a big, impossible task. How can we do this? Well, we have to remember, it was Jesus who promised, back in Matthew 16, verse 18, that He is the one. He is the one who will build His church. Yet He chooses to build His church through us. He chooses to use us. As imperfect as we are, He chooses to use us. He works through us, through our lives. That's why He commissions us. He brings us in to send us out. And we remember that Jesus is the one that has all authority. Right? Verse 18, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Right? He is the one that has authority over all disease, over demons, over sin, over death, over all creation, over every nation, over every life. He is the one that has authority. And so it's because of this authority that he now commissions us to go, to go make disciples. And so our going, our going and engaging people with the truth of the gospel is always, it's always a response to his sending. We go because he sends. Okay, so it's under his authority that we do this. But remember too what Christ had just done prior to this passage, right? Remember that he went to the cross He demonstrated his great love for us. And that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Not after we got ourselves all nice and neat and cleaned up. He died for us while we were still sinners. Demonstrate, showed his love for us. Which now moves us to love others by helping them know and follow Jesus. I firmly believe the most loving thing we can do for someone Today is to help them know Jesus. Help them grow in their relationship with knowing the saving work he has done for them in their lives. And so we go make disciples for God's glory because of his great love for us. But his love for us is seen as we look back at the cross, as we constantly remember the cross. But his love for us is also seen in his presence with us now. The end of verse 20. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. He gives us the great promise of His presence with us always as we carry forth this mission. And so if we understand that our mission as Jesus' church is to make disciples of Jesus, why is it so often that we don't do that? Why is it so often that the church seems hindered in making disciples? Why is there so much evidence that making disciples is significantly lacking in the church, especially in the United States today? What hinders us in this? I think there's, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of excuses we could, we could talk about that I've heard from time to time. We could talk about the pace and the busyness of life. We could talk about many of us feeling like we don't know the Bible well enough to be able to teach anyone else. We could talk about feeling like we don't know who to go and disciple. We could talk about things like having the church distracted away from its mission by an overemphasis and overfocus on things like, like buildings or things like that pulling us away from our mission. Again, we could talk about that consumerist mentality that drifted into the church with people coming and saying, what can you do for me? Instead of being equipped and sent out. I think all of those things have contributed in some way to pulling the church away from its mission. But I wonder if it's more basic than that. I wonder if it's more basic than that, why we get so distracted from making disciples. You see, Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I wonder if one of the great hindrances to making disciples in the United States today is that other loves abound in our hearts more than Jesus. I wonder if that's the simple reason discipleship has been so hindered in the United States. Other loves are pushing our mission out of our hearts. There's a well-known quote by John Piper who, who, who says, missions exist because worship doesn't. Missions exist because worship doesn't. In other words, the reason we go and plant churches, the reason we send missionaries is because worship doesn't exist to the extent that it should around the world. And so missions exist to help people worship their true God, their creator. But in the context of that quote, a, a few sentences later, Piper says something else that hits me even more when we start thinking about this idea of what hinders us in our mission. He says, Seeking the worship of the nations is fueled by the joy of our own worship. He says, You can't commend what you don't cherish. You can't proclaim what you don't prize. If it isn't true in our own hearts, How can we possibly expect it to become true in somebody else's heart? Our words will just ring empty. If it's not true in our own heart, how do we possibly imagine to go share that with someone else? And so we have to ask, do we treasure Christ? Has our love for Christ grown so cold that we don't really care about whether or not our neighbors or our coworkers, our friends, family, and others know and follow Jesus? I pray, I pray God would give us a holy curiosity about him. To seek after knowing him. To seek after knowing how he works in the world. To give us a holy curiosity. And then take and mix that holy curiosity together with this compelling, responsive love for him that moves us to go and make disciples. Because knowing our King should always lead us to going and making Him known. Lord, help us in that.